please do this at your own risk. But it's only nine volts. And if it, if it, it makes you jump a little bit, it's a good battery. Ah, yep, it's good. I'm gonna do today <clears throat> it's Saturday November 30th and uh, I've been working with or I've been chatting with and getting some um, advice from an old acquaintance who has now become a friend um, Matt DiMatteo who produced the first Big Wreck record with Chris Wardman and Big Wreck I found him on Facebook um, I respect him greatly for his his production, uh, his drumming, his songwriting. Um, so as I've been getting into production, I found him, reached out to him, and then we've been chatting quite a bit. And he is working on some songs himself, and I like really like what he's doing. And I said, hey, can I tr throw some drums on this track and, and see if they work? <clears throat> if they don't work, because it's a very electronic um, sound that he's going for. Very modern, really cool. Anyway, I'm gonna record, I'm gonna play to his song, record some eight microphones into the computer, and just send it to him, unprocessed, unmixed, un no EQ, no compression, just the mics and me playing drums. And if he can make it work in his song, great. If he can't, then no biggie. But at least you get to see me set up mics play drums a little bit and you know just I guess basically you're just gonna see how I set up the mics and I vary how I do the mics I'm always trying to improve I usually end up going back to the simple stuff that just kind of works like a 57 on the snare drum and I get new equipment and I want to try it out and I'll end up using it and it may not even be something that works I just use it because it's new and then I learn over time I, eh, I don't really need to do that or I could do something different or things just change evolve and and it's just fun to experiment with different mic techniques and you look up stuff and you try it out see if it works if it doesn't work and one thing I've done lately is I've made a message uh, reminder on my phone to take a picture of all the microphone setups every time I do a song so I have a record of what I did because I have songs that are just a year ago that I couldn't, I cannot recall exactly what I did with the microphones. And if I listen back to it and I like the way the drums sound or I want to go for that same sound, I need a picture or some kind of record of it. So I've been taking pictures of my setups so that I can reference them in the, fu in the future if I want to go back to a certain sound. And keep in mind when you see this, if you know the old Big Rex stuff, the first album, there are no overhead microphones on that drum set whatsoever. And I will try to cover what that setup was in the future. And I'll ask Matt to help me remember exactly what that setup was if you want to go for that kind of sound on the first record. But what I've learned is that most of the sound you get is coming from the musician like if you've got a great guitar player in a room that's got a great sound you throw up a, a decent mic um, you're gonna get a good sound you're basically capturing what's happening in the room so a lot of my sound is in these things here and in my shoulders and my my whole body and the way I've grew up and the way I play and just it's just me so you won't be able to get my sound but you know I'll show you what I do and maybe that'll help you figure out what to do on your end. Um, so anyway, let's get started. I'm going to go upstairs in my bedroom. A uh, pretty decent sized bedroom, which is great for drums. And you don't need a big room like this. You can use anything. Just use what you got. The most important thing is just, just freaking do it. So let's go do it. Alright, so that's where I was just sitting. 
and using the webcam on this. Um, <clears throat> so I have this, which I used for many years. And before this, I had a Mo2 A28. This is an eight channel interface by Focusrite called the Sapphire 56. It's not no longer being made. This gives me the ability to use eight microphones. Now, if you get beyond this and you want a better sound, you start getting into preamps. These are the same thing where the mics plug in, but they have a better sound. These are um, these are Neve 1272s. This is a BAE. 1073 MP. All I do is I really plug the microphones into as many good microphone preamps as I can. And then they go into the line inputs of this. Over here I have microphone cables that I did not put away properly because I was in a rush. So we got, we're gonna have to use eight of these puppies, the XLR microphone cables. These are drums that were found by Lara. Slingerland Radio Kings, the best drums, in my opinion, ever made. So, he ended up buying the kid who wanted to start playing drums, a drum, $400 drum set or something. New Brand new one. Setting it up, getting them started, and taking these, which were really rough and needed a lot of restoration. But <clears throat> I've taken them all apart, put them all back together, and, and they're, they sound wonderful. I've got a Remo Power Stroke Coded 3 on the bass drum. Coded Ambassadors on the toms. These are old... Uh, these are old Zildjian's. I think this is a this is actually a Istanbul K Zildjian. Um, and on the front of the bass drum is just an ambassador coated. It's got a hole in it with a little bit of padding in it. Inside the bass drum, I put an AKG D112. I'm going to put it directly in the bass drum. This bass drum has a hole in it, so I can actually just drop it in there, which is helpful. It saves me a stand getting in there and the possibility of ripping this this is delicate so I don't instead of sticking it in there with a stand I can just drop it in the hole there drop it in the hole and then I will reach in there and attach this so I have to pull it up and I want it directly in front of the beater so I just set it at the right level I actually do something that's really awful for cables and you shouldn't do but I do it <laughs> I tie it around there usually you use big old drums like this with no holes and nothing in them which sound a lot boomier and that one's that one's at a high pitch right now because of the the temperature it's a real calfskin and I also have the original bass drum from the big wreck days up there. This is Laro's studio, by the way. Some ventilation. So I went up there on this ladder. See if I could find that head, the original Big Wreck tour head. And I found it. There it is. Like I was saying earlier. The first record did not have any overheads. And when I say overheads, I'm saying like <clears throat> about six feet overhead you usually put, and I'll be doing that today, putting some uh, overheads here. I'm actually gonna be using the Glenn Johns technique and I'll show you what that is. But yeah, I hit, this, I hit the drums so hard. Um, I don't hit them quite as hard as I used to. When I was younger, I overplayed and I hit the crap out of drums. And I used to crack a cymbal probably once every month or so on the road. And I'd have to get new crash cymbals from Zildjian, um, which is kind of excessive. So anyway, I played them too loud. So recording me back then was a challenge. So they, used, they didn't use anything over the cymbals at all. It's all room mics, stuff out, out in the room that are in the, 
and the close mics that are capturing whatever symbols you hear. All right, so next I'm gonna put a bass drum mic on the outside. What I prefer to use on the outside bass drum is this, Neumann. It's my best mic. It's a 1973, so it's hard to decide where to use this sucker. Um, so I end up, um, last time I used it over the drums like this, just to capture it all. It sounded pretty good. A lot of times I use it out here as in figure eight mode, which means it picks up the front and the back, but not the sides. And that setting is that one. You put it on this setting, and as the circle says, it gets everything all around the mic from every direction, including the side. So everywhere around the mic, that gets it. It's called omnidirectional. This one is figure eight. So it picks up the front, picks up the back, and it rejects the sides. And the most commonly used one is cardioid, which picks up the front and rejects the back. So it would only get this part it wouldn't get anything from the back. So if you wanna keep the noise of other instruments out, you wanna use it on cardioid. On the Big Rec first album, we used a figure eight, I know, out in the room, probably like eight or 10 feet. So uh, I think I'm gonna do that today. But anyway, I'm skipping this one. I need to get, so since I can't use that for the bass drum outside mic, so what I did last time, which seems to work, is to use that 535EB. Let me find that sucker. All right, so this is the this is a AKG C 535EB, about 300 bucks on uh, eBay. They don't make them anymore. I set it to negative 14 flat response. So I put this right in the center, and just so you know. This is not my typical setup. Usually I have that bass drum mic. My favorite bass drum sound is that mic, the D112, outside in the very middle, two fingers away from the center of the drum. Now Matt, who I'm recording this for, likes to have something on the inside so that he has the snap and the punch. So I'm doing this for him. This was actually his recommendation to set this bass drum up this way. Because I have a lot of the boomy stuff. This one's a little tighter and punchier. Uh, more controlled sounding. This microphone cannot be put two fingers away. So this microphone cannot handle that. I put it four fingers away. Sure, SM57 for the snare drum. And position it right there. I position it um, slightly off the rim. And that's just what worked for me. We got two bass drums snare drum. Next we will do, I'm going to do a floor tom. Floor tom I use a Sennheiser MD421 and that is going to go like this. All right. So satisfying to plug things in. All right so next we're going to put on, let's put the room mic out, the Neumann. We're gonna put it on figure eight, so it gets the front, not the sides, and the back. So it gets like a lot of room sound. <clears throat> Which is, it's gonna get the hallway too. Hey, I wonder if I should put it here. So it gets the room and the hall. That might be cool. I've never done that before, so I'm gonna try it. If it sounds good, it's good. If it's not, I'll just put it somewhere else. All right, so we got that. We're gonna give that a shot. That might be cool. Cause you got this sound in here. Check, check, check. And then back here, you got this sound. Yoo! Maybe I'll put it like right in the middle. How cool. Hmm. I've never done this. It's fun. Now we're gonna put six, seven overheads in Glenn John's style, which is one right over the middle of the drums up high, and then one equidistant to that one off to the side, off to the side of the uh, floor tom. For the Glenn John's um, overheads, I'm gonna use the AKG 
414 ULS. These are made in between 1986 and 1993. They're the uh, they're like 700 bucks on eBay. They have more expensive ones that are older and better, but I cannot afford them. And these things have a bunch of settings on them. I set them for overheads um, on the cardioid setting. They have hypercardioid, omni, and figure eight. And feel free to just try whatever you want. But that side that those things are on is the side it picks up. I put that down towards the drums. Also on the back, you have a pad, like on the AKG 535. Um, I believe I need a 20 dB pad to not blow these things up. Um, and also it has a bass roll off. For overheads, I generally take out the very low end frequency, which is 75 or below. So I put it on 75 setting. You can leave it flat if you want and do that in your DAW recording software and just roll it off in there. But I like to do it on the mic. All right, so I have this thing about 45 inches above the snare drum. I've heard people use 46, 42. Matt likes a U87 32 inches right above the snare drum. I tried that, it worked okay, nothing wrong with it. Um, I think I play a little too loud for things to be that close to me. So this one's right in the middle of the drums, right overhead. And what you got to do with the Glenn Johns technique, or I do, I don't know if you have to, like I said, Google, but I measure the distance from the snare drum, the center of the snare drum. So I'm holding this thing here and I can't do it when I'm, when I'm holding this camera also, cause I don't have a cameraman. I hold it there and measure up to here and this is approximately, and this is 45 inches from the screen. Now I'm gonna use the same distance to go over here, and I'm gonna go put the mic here and go 45 as well. I don't know exactly where to put it. Slightly above the tom, off to the side, but 45 inches from the center of the snare drum. Pointing at the snare drum, when you look at both of them, it's something like that. And, and if this doesn't sound good, do something else. All right, so we have seven microphones now. Two on the bass drum, one inside, one outside, a 57 on the snare, 421 on the floor tom, two 414s on for overheads in the Glenn Johns setup, a Neumann U87 on the figure eight out in the room in between, in the, right in the middle of the doorway. Now I have one more input, and this is the secret weapon, the secret weapon. Uh-oh. I want you to see when I take these realistic PZM microphones. These were used on the first Big Rec album and they sounded so incredible that I got some. Now, a lot of times I have to get my soldering iron out because these are hot rotted. They used to take a AA battery to run them. But Chris Wardman taught me to hot rod them. You buy this so you can attach a 9 volt to it. I need to re solder this in there. And then you attach a 9 volt to it. You turn it on and it's just awesome. I think I've been told that the Beastie Boys use these for their drum sound too it gives that real hard edged room sound like Ka! when you put them through compression it's awesome so i put one out in the uh the hallway on the floor and it just it's a huge part 
it can be a huge part of the sound. So the best, most colorful, awesome microphone I have is this cheap, realistic PZM. Trying to find my soldering iron. I'm looking through here. Yep. So I used to bring this stuff on road with me to fix whatever I need to fix. And then since I've been home for 15 years, I've uh, had a backstage pass. So cool. Charlie's name's on there. Hey, Charlie. Um, all kinds of stuff to just fix whatever when I'm on the road. So it's just kind of a catch-all right now. That's where this thing was. Besides attaching a 9-volt, you need to put the XLR on it because it comes with just a regular quarter-inch unbalanced connector, and you have to put this on it. I don't honestly remember exactly how I did it. You cut it off and you buy one of these and put it on, but pretty simple. I'm sure you could Google it if you could find one of these online. Maybe I should buy some more before you guys get online and buy them all. Let's get a little drop. Stick it on. And see? Attached. That one's still attached, so these things break all the time. Put this out here in the hallway, 25 feet. Just gonna put it on the ground here in the middle of the hallway on the floor, on the hard surface. Here's a tip and trick for you. To test the nine volt, I think I learned this from Patrick Benty. He was our fearless, energetic, super talented, sometimes played with us up on stage, um, guitar tech and drum tech um, back in the day. And you put it on your tongue. I don't recommend you to do this. Please do this at your own risk. But it's only nine volts. And if it, if it, it makes you jump a little bit, it's a good battery. Ah! Yep, it's good. All right, so I just put it on there. On the side here, you have the on. It turn, make sure it's turned on. I'm all plugged in. Everything's all set. Now I'll go down to the DAW, comp the computer, the DAW, the Digital Audio Workstation, and make sure everything is getting signal. Okay, so I use Logic, but you can use any software you want. Just go up to Logic Pro X, new, and so we're going to start, we're going to pick audio just like we do on GarageBand. Up here, input one, create. Uh, in my input one, I have the floor tom. So up here I will click, double click, and write floor. And usually I put in what the mic was so that someday when I come back or someone else comes back, they'll know what I used. It's the Sennheiser MD-421. We put it in record mode. All right, so that's one. Now we go, press the plus button. Press the plus button. Go to input two, create. Input two, I have inside kick. So I'll go kick, inside, and it's a D112. Input three is outside kick, and that is a AKG535. Snare, SM57. Number five is my 414 on the left side. So I'll go L414. And usually I put in like how many inches it was. 45 inches above 
middle. I've done it above the snare drum before, and this time I did it above the middle. Try different things. Number six, Glenn Johns, also 45 inches. The Neumann, U87, figure eight in between hall and room. Hopefully I'll remember what that is and what that all means if I ever need to. Uh, number eight, we have the PZM in hall. I'm going to put these all on record so they all record. When I press record, I will um, go upstairs and play and see if I get level on all the tracks. And if some are too loud, I'll turn them down. If some are too soft, I'll turn them up. And that's what I do next. So I'm gonna go up and play a little bit. That might work. Let's give that a shot. Make sure the mics are where they're supposed to be. Make adjustments if necessary. This thing is messed up. Of course, one of the most important things to do is to make sure your drums sound good on their own. And closing doors, turning off air conditioners, try to get it as quiet as you can. Basically, you just want to have the mics not distorting, giving you a good enough level, and that's it. This is where I was just playing a little bit before I came down. Press stop, go back to the beginning. I'm just going to, right here, you can make it fatter and shorter. That is an okay size. Those are okay size. This is a little small, the PZM. The PZM's here, so I'll just crank it up. The 414 left, I want it to match the 414 right. And those are those two, so the left is way lower. The left is going into channel five, and the right is going into channel six, which is one, I have two here, one, one, two, three, four, five, six. So you can see, <clears throat> I don't have them. They should be probably pretty much matched on those two. So we got five and six. So I'll just turn that one up. And that should fix that. And, all right. And I'm going to do what I always do when I don't have something that I want. You go edit, undo recording gets rid of it for you so you don't take up all your hard drive space. So I'll go up and do it again and see how my levels are. All right, so I just played a little bit and I have some pretty good volume. I think I could still turn up the PZM. PZM's going from this into this, so I can turn this one up a bit more. So let's just listen to what this sounds like. I'm gonna be listening on my NS10s through a Carver PM350. And this has, so this is just completely raw, no, um, no anything. I haven't mixed it, changed the levels or anything. What I will do is just on the left and right overhead, Glenn Johns things, I'm going to put one, the left one, all the way left, and the right one, all the way right. All right. Let's see what this sounds like. Wow. Sounds pretty good. 
good start. I mean, now I'll go through and solo these for you. Now if you want something to repeat a certain section, you can go like this and I'll put this to the front. So every time you play it, it'll start there, see? Stop, back, it goes back to that yellow thing. So I can have it play on loop while I show you what all these sounds sound like. You press the S and it'll just show you, it'll just solo the, uh, that microphone. Here's, this is the floor tom, just the floor tom. That sounds pretty good, it's not distorted. Sounds fine. Inside kick. I'm listening for distortion mostly. Make sure I got a strong signal and it's not distorted. I hear a little bit of distortion, but it's a nice solid sound. I'm going to leave it alone. Here's the outside kick. It's a pretty strong sound. Now, after, uh, after you get your basic recording, there's gonna be a ton of EQ, well, maybe not a ton, but you can put, you can fix these sounds a lot with EQ. Um, and compression and mixing and everything so just for right now you just want to make sure you got a good signal it's not distorting it sounds pretty good there's this snare drum it sounds pretty nasty that's how it sounds before you put EQ and compression and everything on it all right so here's the left side of the overheads on the right side. I'm listening to make sure it sounds like a good image, a good stereo image. Sounds good. Make sure this one's not distorted. Oh yeah, this one looks like it's distorted, so let's see what that sounds like. I don't think it's... It doesn't sound bad. I'm gonna just turn down that left one just to get rid of those peaks right there. All right, just to be safe, I guess. But the snare drum is pretty hot too, but the snare drum doesn't reach the edge. This one does. All right, so that's channel five. So one, two, three, four, five. I'm just gonna turn down the output a little bit. Okay. Here's the, that's the one, that's the Neumann in the hallway, in the doorway. It sounds great, I think. Wait until you put like compression in, on that, oh my God. Let me just show you what compression does quickly. I'm going to put 1176 on it which in the Waves version it's CLA, it's a Chris Lord Alge, Algae 76. And it has a bunch of uh, presets you can use. You can use Rock My Room. I usually start with this and then I adjust from there. But listen to what it sounds like with that compressor on there. I like to drive it even more. So what you got in here is the input, the output. So if you want to smash it real a lot, smash it more, 
compress it more, put the output, put the input up, and you bring it down if you just to match other sounds in the um, in the song. The attack is how fast the compression attacks the signal. So if you put it on fast, it's going to go squash it right away. If you put it a little slower, it lets the transients, the attack, the the actual hit go through before it squashes the signal. And that's the trick. You want to get it uh, and it, you want to be able to hear the attack before it squashes it or not. Whatever you want. So let's listen to what that sounds like differently. So that's That's grabbing it right away. That you can hear more of the attack. It's pretty fun. And you have release. Release is how quickly it lets go. See how it's not letting go at all? The release is really slow right now, so it's not letting go at all. You let the release go fast gonna let it go and it's gonna do this that crazy pumping sound pretty cool so with, without now we got the PZM this is the one in the hallway it sounds great by itself you can also smash the heck out of this one too if you want uh, let's try a different compressor can we use what does the Puig child sound like that's a Puig child 660 uh, based on the Fairchild Sounds pretty good. All right, so that's just the room mics squashed by compression. Everything else just flat and not mixed. All the levels are still the same. All I did was put the left on the overhead and right on the other on the right overhead and I then I squashed the heck out of these and you know it depends on if you want that sound or not that's not really cool these days but uh you know who cares so what you do next you go and add EQ so these are again these are called plugins you can go to your plugins just go to EQ I'm just gonna use a simple one that probably everyone has I know this one comes with GarageBand. And you got these different things. You got this thing that cuts off everything below a certain frequency. So you can kill all the low end is over here. And the high end is over here. So you could kill all the high end. But let's just do the simple stuff for now. A bass drum a common frequency to boost to make it sound warmer and fatter and more low endy is is 60 hertz so you go down select 60 so i'm going down with this thing select 60 and i'm picking this one because it's going to give just a little a little a little hill we just want a little hill and we're going to go up a little bit and basically you're gonna go up until it's you like it you can uh, some people say use 3 DB sometimes I use 6 sometimes I don't use anything sometimes you just go nuts um, this <laughs> will probably let me let me list, let you listen to what this sounds like as it happens so you can get a get a get an idea all right so there's 60 
hear it? Wow. Lots of low end. Now, you can make this hill wider or fatter, so you can grab all the frequencies around it, or just 60, that's just 60. If you grab everything around it, hear how it grabs everything? So whatever sounds good to you. And a lot of times you, on bass drums, you take out the low mids. Now low mids, see there's a low, it goes down to 20. You can hear from 20 to 20,000 in the human ear. Now the mids, I'll hear, I'll let you listen to what they sound like, and we're gonna take some of this stuff out. It's make, it's kind of like a boxy sound. So I'm gonna crank this all the way up, and this is how you, like I showed you in the other video on the other thing, how you would find a frequency that you don't like. You turn it up as loud as it goes, find what sounds horrible, and then turn it down. Okay, so let's do that. And this is again, this is the inside bass drum mic, the D112. All right, so I'm gonna find what I don't like. Ow. I don't like that. 156. And now let's find something else we don't like. We'll use another one. <laughs> it all sounds pretty awful, but... Ooh, that's a bit, that's a... Or you can go down here and see when you take stuff out what sounds good too. I can't really hear much, to be honest with you. So sometimes, if you're not doing anything good, just don't do it. Ow. I'll take that out. And I take it out, you can take it out pretty harshly, or you can take it out a little bit, like, whatever you want. Play around with it. Hey, where'd my other one go? Oh, there it is. So, with EQ, without EQ. And we got the inside bass drum mic. I mean the outside bass drum mic. I think I might put that other frequency that I liked on this one, 85. Let's see if that one sounds good here. Wow, ballsy. Ooh. Wow, it's got a nice sound around Put in however many you want. You want. Whoa! Holy crap! In the snare drum, um, let me just go over that quick. That's one of the more important ones. Um, I like to boost 200 in the snare drum, and I also like to boost the high end to get. What's good to do is put it to 5k on it. Whatever sounds good, that's not really doing anything for me. Let's see. And you can take out the mid-range if you want. Get rid of that boxy sound. Hear how that kind of smooths everything out? You just take some of that out. Or a lot of it out. Like I said, whatever sounds good. Be afraid to break the rules. Do whatever sounds good. All right, so I'm not going to mess around with it much more. I'm just going to record this song for Matt. 
and let's listen to a little bit of that. He said it was okay for me to share with you guys Matt DiMatteo, the original producer for Big Wreck and Loving Memory of, wrote this really cool song, and um, I'm going to put some drums to it, and it may work or it may not. But here is the song. I hope I want to blow my speakers up. So you get the idea. I love it. <clears throat> I don't care if you don't like it. I love it. <clears throat> yeah, I should have asked him for the tempo in a message, but I had to guess it by tapping it on my metronome on my on my phone. I found it's 147. So make sure it stays in with the click. That's all set. Now I'll go do some more takes. All right, so I just gotta hit record and go upstairs. <laughs> 